Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode. Hopefully, my voice is loud and clear. <coughs> I would like to speak about a concept that I call vehicles of the incarnate. And in some sense, I wanted to pretty much look into the free will <clears throat> and not only share a multidimensional approach of, a, of free will with the audience, but to also say that the vehicles of the incarnate are not just vehicles that are physical, that we in some sense as creatures direct our mind in accordance to inner phenomena. <clears throat> now, you see, the human being, it's an interesting case. On some level, uh, we don't see that the macrocosm is not in our face, and so we are How can I say it? We are dwellers of a world that we cannot fully comprehend. We tend to identify everything due to what is visible, not wondering if there is more rooms to the house we're in. I find that <clears throat> even science has come to points of acknowledging a sort of potential for a multiverse. Now what that implies is that what we thought to be a simple universe, uni means one, has become a multiverse. And so that would imply that the world stands more than how the one language of one dimension can contain it. That means if we're wondering about other dimensions, how can we just uh, relate everything to this dimension? It's this strange situation that even if there were Demand if like think about it. It's like we're trying to <clears throat> wonder about the dimensions of the color spectrum. Then we're on like let's say uh, the blue color of the rainbow. You know the blue color on the color spectrum that light that goes into a prism and comes out as the color spectrum. Let's say we're on the blue light, <clears throat> and so we in some sense want to go to the red dimension. And we say, no, if red is not blue, we can't accept it as another dimension. You see, it's, it's on some level, the language is not evolving, it's solidifying. And anytime you see that in history, it's, it's, it's a note to be of concern. I find myself as a phenomenon, simply. Many times I've tried to philosophize reality, look at it from different angles. <clears throat> Ever since I noticed you can look at an object from different angles, I started looking at subjects from different angles. And you won't believe the amount of dimensions of meaning there is. Everything in this world that is known can have added dimensions. It's ridiculous. There is a free-for-all of interpretation for the explorer's eyes. That means it's like some things in life, you know, you can't get, you can't understand it by seeing it once. Sometimes I'm like, what is this? That in some sense, when you listen to evolutionary biologists, you're kind of, your mind is cast back to the moment where there was a chimpanzee and an unknown descendant. <clears throat> that means we are, our descendants are ch half chimp, half we have no clue. And when we look at ourselves compared to all the other species on this planet, we're different. <clears throat> now this doesn't mean in most immediately we've got to jump into some abstraction for truth. I'm just saying that when we look at other species and when we look at ourselves, we see way more out of this room than others. So in the Buddhist context, they perceived it strangely as a vehicle. 
That means in ancient times, because there were gods, there were other dimensions, people didn't take the dimension that seriously. <clears throat> but ever since Friedrich Nietzsche said man killed, uh, ma uh, God is dead and man killed him, it's another way of saying that man killed God in his mind. But it doesn't mean subconsciously he's not trying to be God through cyberspace culture. The concept of vehicles has been present in Vedic thought uh, by the term of Yantra, if I remember correctly geometrical vehicles that alter the tension of the human being. I find that this world does have a geometrical translation. I feel on some level we can look at this world and just see design. On some level you can look at this world and see various conditions and freedom in those conditions that appear as your free will. <clears throat> my Really my multidimensional approach to free will is that if we think that the body is just uh, a projector, in some sense, yes, you don't have technically free will because it's the world is moving before you are moving to yourself. Like I didn't have a free will to choose my face, I didn't have a free will to choose my body, I didn't have a free will to choose the nation I was born, I didn't have a free will to choose the kind of environment I would be raised in. It was just pretty much eyes opened and phenomena occurred. <clears throat> And it's not that I would change it, you know. It's just that life moves. And in some of those states of movements, we have control. There, I have my mind has uh, con con considered the multidimensional approach to free will only possible that, as if the Rebu Gita said it, that there is a state that even in waking, conscious waking, in dream, in dream states and in deep sleep, you will feel the common denominator state, this fourth state, which is the state of the witness. And it's pretty much how I find personally that a mind becomes an attributeless field to itself, so it becomes the whole moment. I feel we reduced the world earlier than we could, in some sense, look at. So, vehicles of the incarnate. This is crucial because, um, I mean, anybody who has the intelligence to drive a vehicle, pretty much, you, in some sense, give direction <clears throat> to something that has a certain force. And if you really look at life, all people's work, all jobs are just mostly giving direction to things. So on some level, you can look at your car as a vehicle, you can look at your physical body as a vehicle, you could look at the planet as a vehicle moving in space, you can look at the cosmos as a vehicle, you can look at your inner realm's thoughts as vehicles for your attention, not per se for your, your visible dimensions. <clears throat> so in some sense, this concept of vehicles is very crucial because it means you can control the outcome of a moving system oscillating between the known and the unknown. I feel there is an inseparability of the self and the world. I thought I was just myself. And then I ask myself, how am I myself? And then I notice that I am only myself because I, there is something that I have done, the mind has done, that it has separated itself from everything to be itself. So strangely, we actually oh, oh, were, we are a collective being that has separated. Therefore, our natural nostalgia or future archaic revival will be that of <clears throat> a sort of attempt at omniscience. I feel we're either going to remember we are in the nature's ocean or technologically we're going to access that ocean. 
I feel after some point, it's no longer just people walking in the street, it's energy directed. <clears throat> the world is a fascinating place. The world is such a incredible place where you have no idea what people will do. You have no idea, uh, in some sense, how the future unfolds. I feel we are riding the waves of the future in the now. I speak about in these talks that you're a creature of attention before you're a creature of thought. And this attention comes across as instantaneous being that has no secondary, no motion, no movement in time. So you are discovering a state of mind where the ripples are no longer there. <clears throat> when you study that rippleless mind, a lot of people now in the world will come to states where they will feel they are nothing and everything. It's a very interesting time. It's the dualistic, uh, what do you call it, the polar mind. We thought we're a person that is good or bad. Now we are seeing good and bad are dimensions and the personality can animate in between any wavelength between these, between the spectrum. Salvador Dali says, <laughs> ah. he says, do not fear perfection, you will never reach it. <clears throat> and Osho says, you are going from perfection to perfection, not from imperfection. The eyes of human beings have opened in many ways. Your eyes is one of those ways. I feel that we are not just our biology. I feel the biology is a part of what we are. There was a time I was thinking about free will and I'm like, before we even had even the objective evolution, a sort of legs emerged, a sort of blueprint for in genetics of a creature with legs before a creature before creaturehood projected it was all just nature so we can say free will is a rare conditional opportunity of the species it is real in some dimension but it is not real in all dimensions They asked Swami Krishnananda, what is religion? He said, God remembering himself, and the guys started crying. Because really, we are either going towards thinking we are separate, and our excitement will be infinite speed, or thinking we're collect collective, and our excitement would be uh, what individuality extends forth from the void.
You know, on some level, guys, everything I tell you, <clears throat> I'm just a projection. I'm just sounds in the void. I am just movements in the stillness of the cosmos. But what we realize, we all are. And of course, it is very easy. It is always easier to destroy something than build it. Therefore, it is easier to see the void before the infinite. The infinite is the attempt, though. Because in some strange way, evolution has been continuing. We've just been continuing on and on and on. You know, it's like it's like nature came to our ancestors. Hey, you guys want to die? And our ancestors were like, no, thanks. You know, and nature was like, all right, you guys continue. <laughs> <coughs> Something has endured. And so I feel because the world is so unknown, because really we're like a, strangely on a sphere in a vacuum, it's kind of like it's normal for there to be nothing. It's normal for there to be no meaning. The free will is the update. I feel, I feel uh, free will is how a planet updates into a sophisticated reality. You know, it's like human beings are the planet's way of seeing itself from above, you know. I think when a planet goes outside of the, sorry, when a person uh, goes outside of a, the atmosphere of a planet, that is technically an out-of-body experience for the Earth. <laughs> If we're creatures from the earth. <clears throat> By the way, welcome to the chat section. You know, what are we left with at the end of our lives? A vast collection of experiences that are coming to their conclusion, as if my whole life is an essay. Who knew? Who knew? <laughs> my whole life is an essay, you know? It has a certain premise, what I feel I am, and what I will do. And it's so unknown, Gus, that it's as if, like, the mind is a second life. It has to be. Because the physicality is already here. It's as if, guess what? You don't have to imagine the physical world that's here. It's like free imagination. It's imagination. Reality is imagination before you imagined it. It's solidified imagination. And so what it is, is the mind is the unknown factor of it. And because the mind is the unknown factor, that means we are beyond the system's definition. So it makes sense that if before the human design there was no free will, it's like before the seed was planted, the tree had no fruit. <coughs> but on another level, the seed has been planted. He, Homo sapiens roam this earth. Our numbers have become 8 billion. And now we are left to decide where we will go. When I look at physical reality, there's one option to it. You know what I mean? It's like things are apparent. Things are in a certain state of shape. And then through a sort of entropic nature of the universe, the shape goes. So what does that mean? That means if I was in a film right now and I fast-forwarded time, I would not exist to myself. So that means that we are experiencing a little uh, fragment of time. And in that fragment of time, the mind is experiencing endless senses of self. This life is strange. It's as if you can update, so how can you be who you were yesterday?
So guys, here I found um, a picture of a yantra. This is an example of a yantra. It, it, it was it was seen as a geometrical vehicle. Okay. Now you don't know how many people. It's like a mandala. That's how we express it. But it's technically a blueprint for a vehicle. So I wanted to say you don't know how many people I've met who've randomly drawn geometrical shapes, me included. And I've wondered what is this phenomena of that when the, when the mind of the human being goes towards it, art, it eventually has to look at the lines and in between and sort of geometry extends forth. So guys, in the chat section, <clears throat> being human says, Okay, so being human says when you're free from delusion, you can enjoy illusion, enjoy the dream, but enjoy the dream being free. Guys, this is the argument that many make, and this argument is very nice, it's very pleasant, but it is not enough. That means, I, for me, if somebody says the purpose of life is happiness, 24-7 happiness, I'll be like, you're living a weird robotic life. For me, the purpose of life is piloting it piloting it with eyes really open. So after some point, there's no point of taking people to abstract bliss and taking people to harsh reality. After some point, you realize, yes, there is freedom and there is freedom of choice, but there's also an event taking place that requires a certain level of engagement and something that you might not believe. It's, it's kind of like when secular people think, I'm, I'm speaking, they think I'm speaking more spiritual. When spiritual people hear me, they think I'm speaking more secular. Well, I'll tell you this. <clears throat> Forget the voice. Just ask yourself that you are a creature right now. You are governed by where your attention is. And pretty much any question of man's state of being is how else could the attention be to itself? You see, it is uh, so. So, guys, being human says all purpose is illusion. Yes, be the watcher. Let me tell you this thing, being human. Here's the thing that about the watcher. Let me tell you this, guys. The watcher is not. Here's the issue. You know how many people are actually experiencing beyond the language threshold, and they're conscious that there's something else, but because they think it's still the game of the person, they do nothing. This, the issue is we don't want an enlightenment where people begin to have the same outcome as a tree. You're not a tree. Do you know? So it's as if like if a human being does nothing on this earth and says, yay, I use my freedom and bliss and all this. It's like, yes, you did, but you, had, you didn't have a result greater than a tree. Do you know what I mean? So for me, it's about the participation. But here's the issue. So many people running towards the esoteric, towards the spiritual and the met metaphysical. Those people running to destroy their ego into an ever-present moment. Those people will soon realize that eternity has nothing to do. Did you know this? Go towards the eternal. And you'll, you know what you'll notice? You'll notice you don't need a body. And that's the issue. And you're going to climb to come down from that mountain of eternity. You're going to realize that there is a value that only because we thought nature was wrong, we doubted the process. I am telling you, human beings are like artwork. They're like nature's artwork. But they're artwork that can also draw on itself. It's like, a, it's like sculpting a statue, but the statue can now sculpt itself too. You know? <clears throat> yes, but I'm saying that the mind, it will have, it's the consequence. You see, I'm, I, I, am, I am not here to inspire people to do nothing. Because you, there's no point. There's no point being this advanced technology and not using it. You know, and karma is not a good enough reason. Karma, this world is an illusion. We got to get out of it. Solipsism is not enough. The shovels of solipsism will not help us here. <clears throat> because technically a solipsist... Uh, uh, 
that watcher is the point of it is not to be it all the time. Being human, I'm telling you, the, you you are you are trying to be Sri Ramana Maharshi right now. I'm telling you, it, that's not the point. You know, the point is not to be Sri Ramana Maharshi. Like, can you imagine being in front of Sri Ramana Maharshi and trying to be like him? And he's like, dude, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Of course, that's nothing like Sri Ramana personality, but I'm saying, like, listen, I it's okay to go towards oneness, but I'm telling you the point of it is that point of that uh, watcher is not to be it. That watcher doesn't need anyone to be it. That watcher, nothing happens to it. Whether you, you be you are conscious of it or not, it's there, Do you know? So try, it's like it's like awareness. It's like trying to like to to try to be be the watcher. That's you trying to be space. It's like you can't. Awareness is it already. So you're going to notice after some point the the mystical quest is not to get you. There's two options. There's two crossroads. Either you're like one of those old school yogis where you're actually individually going towards the trans energetic transformation and self. Uh, uh, kind of metaphysical self immolation of identity, you know, then there is that. But I'm telling you this. <coughs> oh man. Being human, you're forgetting about the human being. <coughs> In the chat section, you say there's no point. That is too easy. That is too easy, my friend. It is too easy. It's like it doesn't add. It doesn't add anything. You know, it's like saying everything is zero doesn't do anything. It's it's something that even if you hadn't said it, it it's still zero. You know, I am telling you the point of it is that you go from this individual conditioned position. <clears throat> when you come to that state of the watcher as you speak in the chat section being human, that state of the watcher is not meant. You're not meant to just stay that. You're that you're meant to reach an emptiness where a new a new vision comes forth, a new vision comes forth. You you thinking that you're the watcher is like you not realizing that life is changing. <clears throat> but anyways, guys, you know these are these are of course uh, our discussions are of each other's inner loves on some level. <laughs> Oh man, I've got myself into the enlightenment trap, guys, in this chat section. What am I going to do? <laughs> We've reached a point where everything is ego, <clears throat> and the only thing is, is this uh, watcher. I'm telling you, being aware of that wa watcher is nice, you know, but it thinking that enlightenment, Vedanta, ultimately is for a person, you are like... You are thinking right now, you are, I don't know, I don't know. I feel that the purpose is not to be only space. It's like when you realize you're that space, the value of the tool in your hand changes. So for me, I don't know, I don't know. There is, a, there is, a, there is definitely a road of spirituality where you get dissolved in silence. If you are the watcher for too long, you're not going to feel human. And that's gonna that's gonna be like years of conditioning suddenly down the drain. So I'm telling you, don't don't try to be nothing all the time. It's going to you're going to feel a stranger to yourself. You see, just like how you gotta eat it's like it's like, you know, it's thinking that you're this truth. I'm telling you, you still eat food. Um, okay. All right, guys, I'm going to get back to the talk. Uh, I feel that I can share nothing more. Uh, I can add nothing more to the chat section because in reality, guys, um, it's easier to point than look in the mirror. And, of course, the human mind has to express itself. That means if you look at human beings, 
when they communicate after a while you see that it's like I'm telling you those people who experience the number synchronicity thing you know what the next thing after that is for them most likely they experience what nobody's probably talked about they experience the justice out of their own morality <clears throat> So guys, <clears throat> um, being human in the chat section, guys, um, he has brought great points. Just to make myself clear, the thing is that I, I fell into this kind of trap and it was something that I tunneled through. And for some years of my life, I let my inner realms take the steering wheel and I felt a sort of supernatural underlying narrative to my life. The, the, the unknown was, I, I, like I saw a shape in the unknown and I, 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 my attention got dependent on that. I only realized, only came to realize that freedom means freedom beyond definition. So after some point, the language wars must end. Both sides drop their swords only to realize that the ego is the evolution of various contributions. What I would really wanted, what I wanted to say in this talk, guys, by vehicles of the incarnate, I just simply wanted to say that for me, it's strange. It's strange that I thought it is normal to be on a rock in the middle of nowhere. It is normal to suddenly be a creature in a, in a, in a, on a sphere. You know, I thought that all this stuff was normal. For me, I could tell you there's no such thing as growing up. There is just, in some sense, reality re being reverse engineered through its intensity towards, uh, in some sense, uh, I don't know how to say it. Oh, interesting. So, so Dylan, if you've noticed, so guys, Dylan in the chat, if you've noticed, guys, that's interesting to share. Always feel free to share, guys. This chat section, you shouldn't care too much about how I see it. You must just care about sometimes after some point, like it, at first you care for how the other sees. And after that's been just observed, then you care for how well you demonstrate something, right? So I'm telling you, feel free in these chat sections and also freedom means various intensities and elevations can be experienced. I feel that the clue is that we are moving and there is choice. And so you can say a creature, uh, like, you know, it's kind of strange. It's as if like, We have, we didn't have the free will to start the system, but we have the free will to change the system and end the system. <clears throat> we can destroy our species, we can change it, or on some strange way, maybe we created it. Maybe the body is going from the past to the future and the mind is coming from the future to the past. 
In mathematics, time can move backwards. And mathematics, of course, is a language, is a way of explanation. Every person, every human being you ever see speaking, guys, it's a, every human being is a collection of experiences. That means they are being sculpted by their life choices. So guys, Dylan in the chat section says, MW, so I saw a shadow or a claw in the darkness. I like how you brought that up, how you talked on that. Is it a subconscious projection, you think? I will tell you, I will share with you, Dylan, an experience I had in the UK, which out of all the experiences I've had in, in my life, it has been one of the mysterious. Anything I perceive that I don't comprehend, I'm okay with letting it be unknown until I have a conscious strategy to move towards the unconscious. Do you know? But here's the thing I want to say. That I was in the UK, guys, and I'm not kidding. I saw a shadow. I saw a shadow literally move around me in a cubic way, as if my whole moment was cubic. I saw a shadow move in a cubic moment, as if the shadow of a spherical world is cubic. Do you know what I mean? I saw a sh I don't know how to tell you, it was the weirdest experience. It was as if I was seeing an interdimensional movement. An interdimensional in the sense that my eyes were open, perceiving the outer realms, but my inner realms were micro-shifting the outer realms in a sense that I felt that the sphere of the moment had a shadow, shadow that was a cube. So I wouldn't be surprised that it, we are actually energy, and energy that just like how the shores of the ocean constantly wipe what's written on the sand, it's like the mind is constantly through every breath in some sense projecting itself. I feel we are like instruments that are aware of their sound, you know? And they're aware of their sound, but they can't be become certain of who's holding the instrument. Now, some people believe it's God. Some people believe it's the laws of the universe. Some people believe it's, it's nothing. Some people believe it's various ways the eyes of the human has opened to this. You know, for me, it, it's like this. I, I, I learned this from kings. And what, what that means is I, I found myself in, you know, with my family visiting Portugal. And we went to a palace. And this king was so badass. He made a palace where on the walls was giant pictures of other kings. So imagine when you came up to inside, when you walked inside your palace, it was in some sense, <clears throat> like, uh, how would I say it? It was in some sense like you saw giants, and the hallway was giant, the ceiling was giant, everything was big. And I'm like, yo, somebody walking in this palace is definitely going to feel like a king. I even felt like a king walking in that palace. And guys, the palace was about to close, and I remember it was the for first time I, I uh, looked at a museum with the speed of a marathon runner. <laughs> I feel our minds have been exposed to so much design that they overlay them on each other. I think when an emotion happens, just like Photoshop, you have a bunch of layers of images with different opacities, you know. I think I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> with different opaqueness of image, you know. You know, I'll tell you something, Dylan. I think you should check out this audiobook. Let me see if I can find it for you. 
Um, I think it was Don Juan's kind of peyote. It was this guy, this pretty much disciple goes to this shamanic. Oh, here. The teaching. There we go. Oh, my God. Spectator commentary. Get out of here, YouTube video. <laughs> there we go. <clears throat> Let me see, guys. Let me see if there's another video I can find from it. Here, I think I think this is it. <clears throat> so, Dylan, I would recommend you listen to this. This guy speaks about certain native approaches. For example, the smoke was an ally, strangely, in Native American culture. Like, you know, the bird was a witch, like it was like some next level stuff, but like this this is an interesting interesting book to audio book to listen to. <clears throat> so being human, yeah, I agree. I agree. If you if you listen to some of my talks, I I talk about this concept, I call it, that I've designed it as the language threshold. And the language threshold is pretty much when human beings of uh, uh, notice and experience that can't be put into words because it, it is too either instantaneous or inconceivable. It can't be referred to another moment. It is something by itself. I feel that the first thing, the, the first thing is not peace. Peace is not the Oh, ultimate. I don't know. I mean, definitely people go towards peace. But I'm, I'm saying for me, advancement doesn't mean peace. Advancement means you for a certain time, you're in the space-time continuum. You're in a certain conditional situation. And as you are in this certain conditional situation... You can animate. You know, on some level, I got an existential panic attack when I was in Italy, guys. <clears throat> I was in this hotel and I got an existential panic attack because I suddenly noticed the unfathomable. I noticed that, am I just movement and sound right now? I was like, holy shit. <laughs> <clears throat> Yo, guys, I wanted to share something. Um, literally after this talk, I'm um, on, I mean, I don't know, maybe people don't have to join, but you're going to get access to the live, live version of this. Um, I'm going to pretty much set up Discord. You know what? I'm going to set it up as we speak. All right, guys, <clears throat> here's, the, here's the link. People who go on this uh, community, sorry, guys, just uh, I got to share this because um, anyways, I'm trying something out for the first time I've never done for two hours, guys, today specifically for those people in School of Athens 2.0, uh, I'm going to open up Discord. So pretty much after this talk, I'm going to set it up and I'm going to be available there if anybody has questions. 
I mean, just just before people leave, can the people listening say where they're listening from, what location? I want to see. I think most people listening are listening from America. Then I could set the Discord hour at a different time. Someone listening to this out of nowhere is going to be like, what is this guy talking about? <laughs> <coughs> Subscribe to find out, you know? <laughs> Guys, for me, it's, uh, it's literally like we have no other option other than to see how advanced we can be. There's nothing cooler than that, you know? There's nothing more visionary than that. It's it's like we have an ability if we don't use it before the species closes its eyes. It's intense. guys let's um, I'm gonna continue with this talk then uh, we'll see what happens <sighs> what does a person do they stare into the soul of their moment only to realize the moment goes forth for me it was for a time an intellectual precision that kept me oriented and before that, there was a sort of religious kind of... And the religion for me was never an ideological thing. It was my relationship with my... It was it was like a blueprint for my inner realms and the environment I was raised. I only after I got, I, I got an experience that had nothing to do with religion and had nothing to do with the traditional experience, I got an experience of what I felt was the unknown. And I it was like this where I, I felt like a child born in a world where everyone's saying this, 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 that, this, that, this, that, this, that. And then I was just looking at like what 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 if it just remains unknown? What is this simplicity of the unknown? What is it that like that moment before you grabbed a cup of water, it was unknown? And then something became known. So it's like a progression. It's like a series of events. I feel our, we are living two lives in one moment, just like we have two eyes that see the same view. <clears throat> we have to realize that the, the vision of the human being surpasses every person's individual life. That means I realize something about the voice of man that in some sense his physical body is in the awe of, that we in some sense can move in many ways before we move. That is the power of the mind. I could tell you that there was a time when I befriended the spirit of importance. That means it's strange, you know? It was, it's like I'm telling you, there has been times, strangely, where I felt I was gifted by my inner realms. Now, what I mean by gifted in my inner realms that it was as if I had endured through something. I had just endured. I had just been simple old me, you know? And as simple as a simple person walking in a complex world, you suddenly see the complex in, in, in believe it or not, different simple angles. <clears throat> that means on some level, believe it or not, I, if there were, uh, I, have, I can sit and be nothing to myself. I could just watch. I could literally watch my moment of being like a film for a very long time. And after a very long time, I, you stop identifying with your physical body's movement. You, stop, I, you start identifying with your mind's movement. But then it's like playfully in your mind you're even sitting still. And when the, both the body and the mind is still, that's when the unknown it becomes accessible to the conscious. So what does that mean? That means you are becoming, your body is still and literally there is no opinion on anything and you're just there. And in this simplicity of presence, I keep telling people presence beyond personality. I keep saying that. 
presence. It's instantaneous. And in this instantaneity, there is a simple spaciousness. It's as if, where, how does complexity have the space to happen? And suddenly you realize the simple. And I'm telling you, we are obsessed to constantly make the unknown complex. And when the more complex it becomes, the more out of control it becomes. But at the same time, we also need the mind of civilization to evolve. So on some level, I'm like, okay, physical problem of civilization, resource allocation, the health of the body of civilization. Then the mind. Then the mind of the civilization is how it perceives the body. So technically, we, we need to have much more dialogues. The ratio of conversations about the mind should increase, be more than the conversation about bo body. And that, in some way, it imp feels impossible because of all the medical sciences, right? But the reason I'm saying that is that we need psychologists to be the bridge builders. And in some sense, nobody is anything, really. You are where your attention goes. Do you know? That means there was a time in my youth I had learned the wave, you know, that robot dance, the wave. And I, 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 for a moment I was fathoming, I'm like, could I be a break dancer? <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, I had, a, I had a break dancer's dream for like a moment, you know, in, while doing the wave in front of the mirror, you know? <laughs> And I realize no, <laughs> like it's like I don't find it necessary to move my joints that much, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but it is definitely an achievement. Anything that you endure in, you will reach a point where nobody has put an effort that far, and you will see the new, and then you will pretty much all you're left with is to bring it back to the tribe. This is why it's like some people ask me, why are you calling yourself Mr. Within? And I'm like, because in some sense, I don't care about the titles in history that change all the time. On some level, sure, you have this value system, this grid of perception of what is, okay, I should go do this, it's more valuable, oh no, I should do this, I shouldn't do this, I should do this. There's this all this kind of who wants to be a millionaire morality behind our eyes. But this... <laughs> But this needs to shift, and I feel the only way it shifts, and many scholars have said this, I'm not the only one, it's pretty much the voice of the continental philosopher, that we are left with direct experience. That there was something so beautiful that you could have never been taught. It was one of those mirror moments, but it was a mirror moment for the mind, that you realize the experiencer and the objects and subject of experience are inseparable. That's when the within and the without become no longer locations. So if somebody asks you, what are you, you will remain silent. And if anybody asks you an actual question, you will remain silent. But then your words will come into meaning when you see the importance of the inner realms has something to do with the outer. So I feel those who are conscious on this earth don't just hear the voice of man. They hear the voice of the direct experience of the earth. That means for me, sure, it's so easy. It's so easy to see a bunch of rocks in the middle of nowhere. But I'm saying it is much more complex to wonder where can that go, because in some sense we're hope. It's like why do we care for the continuity of extinction? Uh, why do we care for extinction? Uh, like trying to avoid extinction or bypass it, and why do we care for continuity? Why are people trying to live longer? when we think free will doesn't exist because it's all a material composition. So you see, it makes no sense. The, the, the behavior of our genetical design is in the image of continuity. So it, evolution is like a weird eternal urge to continue of a creature. And what does that mean? That means I think most creatures in nature, of course, they have fear. They have it's as if like this, they, they like they, they have a sort of pro program of uh, instinctual movement with their environment. But human beings have a different, totally different relationship with their environment. Like when you look at a human being, it's a privilege to communicate. You're like like you know, can you imagine just like little kids hearing about evolution and being like, wait a minute, you telling me. We are evolved from animals to speaking animals and there's people in the world who are shy and think they can't say anything or think they can't do things. It's like, do we not see the four billion year old advantage? 
it's like when you are when you are in when you are in the kingdom of the human being in the human design do not act like a peasant of inferior dimensions the human kingdom just like the mineral kingdom animal kingdom all these kingdoms it has a value it has a position it is it is a chess piece in the galaxy you know in the game of the galaxy so we are reaching a point where we're like, whoa, we're not just subjects, we're dynamism, we're a process, we're an experiencer. <laughs> yes, guys, this is life. We are all life. We're all life right now. <laughs> Let's take a moment to just appreciate how this is not just a live stream, but we're all alive right now. <laughs> I don't know guys, I feel that our psychologies are shifting at higher speeds because the technology is making us want to be something else. I gotta say something about the vehicles of incarnate. I'm like that guy who feels that in his inner realms, geometry is that can be the extension of our body. I feel that we are opening up to a geometrical language. And I think all those people who've kind of been drawn to these talks I give, Shri Ramana Maharshi says, let what comes come, let what goes go, see what remains. And when you see what remains, you see the witness, you see that part of you that has noticed conscious existence. And if Albert Einstein has been known to say that man created time so that everything doesn't happen at all at once, if we were to playfully envision everything happening all at once, in some sense, there would be no separation on an existential level. So existentially, there are no humans, there is no cosmos, there's no planet, there's no ideology, it's just existence. You see me? As raw as it gets. And then there is experience, you know, and experience is like existence in a more crystallized uh, view of itself. I feel that our, 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 there is a, there is a geometrical movement of energy. You see, it's just like, it's how insane is this? That we looked in, in the, in the depths of the earth and we found crystals. Wow. So thanks everyone for the nice comments. People are very kind. I am really just not caring too much about ideology. I'm just trying to see what's interesting. And for me, it was like one night I got an aerial view, just in my in my inner realms. I was just something just in my like just somewhere casual and I just in my inner realms I thought I was looking at the whole civilization from like high in the sky. I've had many experiences in my inner realms where I've suddenly felt and it's not you know, I don't even have a it's not me, it's not like a Superman in the air situation. It's like literally a view. 
like my mind is trying to fathom what it would be like if I looked at myself from 100 feet, 100 meters in there, you know. Honestly, the greatest teacher I had uh, in my life, guys, I, I haven't spoken about this a lot in my life, but in my childhood, it was my grandfather's best friend who was this very religious and pious and very friendly and energetic person. Wherever he went, people felt not only peaceful, but happy around this guy. And there was a time where this guy... I remember our, our whole family was a Persian family gathering. We went outside of Tehran and we, I was very young. I was like maybe nine, like eight, seven. I don't know. I don't know. I was pretty young. Okay. I, it was my youth. And I was in some sense, uh, I remember this, this person, we called him Haji Sanaba, right? He was my grandfather's close friend, right? And... I remember everybody went and we went to this natural nature place nobody had been before so everybody was there exploring and I was just standing around kind of looking at things and this guy like I was kind of like everybody was looking right and he calls me to show me something he's found in nature and he tells me to come and see and guys I'll never forget it this guy was smiling and he taps this log this giant log okay like a tree that's fallen and cut up, like a giant piece of tree, but it's been there for like maybe 10 years and it's kind of like, kind of also part of the ground, you know? And so there was this giant log and he just taps the corner of it, taps one side of it, and he opens his hand and a lizard, a lizard runs into his hand. And I had never seen anything like that, guys. And he looks at me and he shows me the lizard and instantly he lets it go. He lets it go as if for a second he commanded the lizard. I later on noticed this and uh, that moment for me was so me strange. It was as if like this man just tapped on, a, on this wood and, and, and this, this creature came into his hand and he let it go. And it was, it was so strange. And I thought to myself, okay, this guy's been raised in the streets of villages. <laughs> but it was definitely a moment where I noticed that it's not just meaning. It's not just the inner realms. There is a value to the outer realms that we can't just say it's the inner realms or beyond this. You know, and we can't just say it's, it's, it's just our ideological views are the validity of it. I'm, I'm pretty much, I'm that guy pretty much saying before you study spirituality or whatever, study language. Study how language, how the world has been put as walls of definition over everything. You know, the linguistic simulation, when you realize, when you are aware outside of the linguistic simulation, anybody could come and say anything to you and you notice that it's just sound. It's just that you can choose to read that sentence whether it's ignorant or not. So, so Dylan, um, you say, can you get, get into those states easily? I will tell you, yeah, but you got to, like, this is my recommendation. F stop thinking about states. Stop thinking about any method. This is just me t giving you a recommendation. This has nothing to do with the talk, you know. But I'm just saying, like, this is my view. You have to realize nobody has your eyes, and that's the first thing. When you realize nobody has your eyes, that means you're the only one who has access to this view of the world. 
Okay. So in some sense, you have to find a moment. I found that moment in a moment where it, it came out of nowhere, where I asked myself a question that made me wonder about the whole, whole setting of my belief. Literally, I, I felt I reached a point where it wasn't about the action. It wasn't, I wasn't doing it for anybody, even with myself or my world. It was just how you remain as being, and then nature's voice moves you. Nature is moving. So when I, when I give these talks, I am not uh, an idea to myself, believe it or not. I'm, with, I'm watching, but I, it, it's, like, it's like this. It's like, how is it that you don't think about your heart and your heart beats? Could it be that you can reach a state of mind as a human being where you don't think about words, but your mind generates them? Could it be in some sense that the unconscious is relatable only if the conscious viewer chooses to expand? Could it be that there is way more to life than meets the eye, you know? And what does that mean? That means your memories <clears throat> are the processing of a tiny the percentage of what is going on. So it's like the person's like, yo, do you have past lives? You're like, I can't. The person's like, do you have future lives? You're like, I can't. And the person's like, what do you mean you can't? You're like, because what you see is me is a very tiny percentage of my being. I, I feel my human existence is the tip of the iceberg of this unknown presence. But this unknown presence is not, doesn't have a personality. This is why I say hilariously all those people running after enlightenment, do you know it's not for a person? It's not an experience where you're a person in it. It's an experience where you notice prior to the person, the presence. When you notice that presence, it's kind of like how Swami Krishnananda says, that's when meditation stops. Did you guys know that there's a time that meditation should be stopped? And that time is when you notice the inseparability of the individual activity and the inseparability of the cosmic activity. That is a sort of Satchit Ananda where the consciousness, individual consciousness, has a sort of collective existence. When it becomes aware of its collective existence, it is in bliss. <coughs> so... <coughs> I often say excuse me guys uh, I often say that something that the person can do really the sages would say is like two options you either trust life or you don't if you don't trust it it doesn't move forth you know it doesn't move forth with the engagement of your will that means like don't be afraid to move that is a birthright <laughs> Don't be afraid to express. That is a privilege. And there will come a day. I, my, my, I, I honestly, my vision for these talks was really, I got like way more, I got, a way, I got way inspired when I realized Buckminster had this quote where he said, I keep inventing. They asked him, why do you invent it? And he's like, I just keep inventing stuff and maybe one day their use will be found. And I, that's kind of the strategy I'm, I, I notice I've, I've been kind of subconsciously taking. That I'm just, you know, dancing my own dance in this world, you know. And people, if, if they engage, they engage if they don't. But on some level, I am telling you that after you have lived for yourself in all ways, both inner and outer or whatever dimensional con constitution you choose, <clears throat> you will realize the value of the collective. And I feel it is now time every human being to care for what humanity, how humanity looks in the mirror, not just how the human being does. So I will end the talk here because the vehicles of incarnation, the moment you step out of that vehicle, it's pretty much duality. So there's a sort of experience beyond this dimension when you go towards emptiness, towards the void, and there's an experience beyond this dimension when you accelerate towards the infinite. Mr. Within is saying, I want civilization to accelerate to the infinite. I want to see what that looks like, pretty much. And geometry is a vehicle, guys. Sometimes you're, you can, there's a, you know, there's a rented car, there's a rented geometry in your inner. <laughs> <coughs> rented geometrical vehicle in your inner. <laughs> 
So anyways, guys, thanks for listening. Um, for those in the School of Athens 2.0, um, I'm going to start the Discord right now. <clears throat> Hopefully most people will talk uh, kind of like slightly drained, but... <laughs> So anyways, guys, thanks for listening. This is the end of the talk. And um, three words that have kind of been <clears throat> the, my, uh, my sort of, uh, uh, my sort of uh, um, image-based spirit guides in the linguistic simulation is rise, mankind. Rise. That is it. It's as if, if somebody said, what's the purpose of life? That's, that's it. You rise. In the conscious waking state, rise like the sun. In your dream states, you know, notice the glow of the moon. In your deep sleep state, let emptiness be emptiness. You might realize that, that you know, what's the greatest peak of mastery? You see that mastery echo in everything. That means there was a time where the logos, in some sense, in my inner realms, whispered to me, very playfully, <clears throat> that you have, you are no longer a student, and you are no longer, uh, in some sense, uh, a student of the world. You have, in some sense, reached a point where, uh, sorry, you're not a student in a classroom. You are in a world of masters. That was the idea. That was the idea that my whole life I was noticing imperfection. Then it, it just for a second went, wait a minute, where is the boundary? Where is the range of subjective identity? You know? I remember seeing this video on YouTube. There was this guy named, <clears throat> I don't really have a comment too much because I don't know much about the person, but I remember seeing this video, the guy was Ben Shapiro, and some some girl was asking him about, for example, this whole, you know, um, identity issue that seems to be going on in Western culture, you know, and I say issue as in it's something that it's being discussed, and it, uh, the girl comes and says, I'm a girl, why can't I suddenly say I'm a boy, you know? And then Ben Shapiro strangely looks at this girl and says, why can't you say you're 60 right now? Why can't you say you're 60? And then the girl was like, for a second she thought about it, and you see, it's not that you can't, you definitely can. You can do anything pretty much. But I'm saying that the human being has to choose to keep an alphabet stable. And it is crucial to some degree, at least in Mr. Ruthin's view, that the biological nature be ascribed. But we realizing that the identity, of course, is subjective. Do you know that people technically don't have identities because they identify with different things every day? If you were in a room of robots, you'd identify, you'd be like, oh my God, it's so robotic in here. You know, I'm identifying as a robot, you know? Like, I've swam in, in a swimming pool and identified with an Olympic swimmer. <laughs> like, I've, I've tried to be, I'd be like, okay, I don't have the skills, I don't have the endurance, but I can have the effort of an Olympic swimmer, you know? <laughs> So, yeah, guys, that's the thing. I'm just saying that it's an interesting time. We're noticing we're not just objects. We're not just sub subjects. So there's coming all these debates of what is the constitution of it. On some level, we got to stay true to something to be something. But on another level, truth is very multi-leveled because everybody has a different DNA. I feel that uh, this is the issue. Back in the day, I think civilization was a savage and unupdated place. So the yogis had way more reasons to go into the cave. You know, I think now we have to take advantage. That means you got to just think like a general of humanity and be like, wait a minute, wait a minute. So you're telling me after all this time 
there is this there is this something there's some image of a civilization even though when you walk in the streets of civilization you see a bunch of cubes and rectangles but i'm saying with very small sidewalks you know it's like ridiculous you know this this doesn't look like an advanced civilization to me an advanced civilization should be artwork that means what the hell are architects doing are we really so budget obsessed that we have decided everything to be rectangular? You know, like you know, what is this? You know, skyscrapers on some level. Wow, on some level again. <laughs> it's like how how many more rectangles do we need to throw in the sky? We need to, in some sense, reach a point where we unleash the epic of geometry. I feel we need to create a civilization that values art. And in some sense, values <clears throat> science. And in some sense, values philosophy. And in these three, in these three positions, the ultimate questions can be asked. That means imagine a civilization that in some sense has a creative effort. Imagine a civili uh, members of a civilization that have, in some sense, a deconstructive effort. And members who maintain. There was a time, guys, the inner realms can be very playful. I learned this from Zen. In Zen, they have a saying, they say, kill the Buddha. And, you know, someone may hear that and be like, oh my god! You know? <laughs> but what the Zen master meant is that so many Zen disciples would go meditate and they would get an image of their inner realms they would get an image of their inner realms I don't know guys, what can I say? The sun leaves a shadow. The shadow wonders about the light. The light creates the shadow and the form stands in between. Our ego's shadow is chaos. The light that hits the ego is the order. There is a poetic dimension accessible to life. There is a, uh, your mind is not just your mind. It's technically also the cosmos happening all at once. Sorry guys, I was coughing. So anyways, thanks guys. Uh, I'm going to try this Discord thing. And then after the Discord, I'm probably going to hibernate like a bear. <laughs> <laughs> but let's see. You know, I'm going to sleep uh, You know, after winter is coming gone, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Nice. Guys, there's something awesome. It's like a fire. It's like a fire where back in the day people would speak in verse. And I can tell you so many in, in this so many times in these chat sections, guys. I've seen people just come and they suddenly tap into a linguistic rhythmic authorization. Do you know? So I'm telling you back in the day there was a time, guys, the people would speak in verse. We were so conscious of the rhythms of the universe that we could, it, it, it's like it was a dance of the breath with the elemental and the subjective. 
<clears throat> so anyways guys thanks for tuning in I'm gonna try this discord thing and for everybody I'm gonna <clears throat> let me just set it up and see how it's gonna go you know so thanks for tuning in guys much blessings and also